Jenny Lind was a very successful and famous Swedish singer and actress and I have found that her biography is very inspiring. My ideal was and is so high that I could find no mortal who could in the least degree satisfy my demands. Therefore, I sing after no one's methods, only as far as I am able after that of the birds. For their master was the only one who came up to my demands for truth, clearness and expression. Those were the words of Jenny Lind. And I'm now going to read a story about her, about her early years and her early career. The Swedish Nightingale In the city of Stockholm, there is one street leading up to the church of St. Jacob on which, in years gone by, there was a constant succession of pedestrians and vehicles. In fact, in 1830, it was one of the most lively streets in the city, and often a passer would stop to look at a window where every day a little girl sat, holding a big cat decorated with a blue ribbon. To this pet, the child sang constantly sang bits of operas or popular airs, which she had heard, and the childish voice was so clear and sweet and true, even in very high notes, that it attracted quite a crowd of listeners, and it became a regular habit for many persons to pause for a moment and listen to the song poured out for the benefit of Puss of the Blue Bow. Among those who saw the pretty picture and heard the song was the maid of uh, Mademoiselle Lundberg, a dancer at the Royal Opera House. She was told such an ecstatic story of the child's beautiful voice that she became deeply interested and having found out that the little singer's name was Jenny Lind, wrote a note asking the child's mother, Fru Lind, to bring Jenny to her home and that she might hear her sing. Fru Lind acceded to the request and when she took Jenny to pay the promised visit and the child's voice had been tried, Mademoiselle Lundberg clasped her hands in rapture, exclaiming, She is a genius! You must have her educated for the stage! The words meant nothing to Jenny, but they struck terror in the heart of the mother. To those old-fashioned notions, the stage was another name for ruin. In vain, the actress pleaded that it would be a sin to allow such talent to be wasted. Still, Fruelind shook her head and the actress diplomatically argued no more but by eager questions learned the history of Jenny's family. Being the wife of an amiable and good-natured man who was unable to support his family, Fru Lind was obliged to keep a small school in Stockholm to eke out expenses, and as she had not time to take care of Jenny as well as teach, the child had for three years been boarded out with a church organist's family not far from the city, but had finally been brought back to become a pupil in her mother's school. Being cared for mainly by her grandmother, to whom Jenny was devotedly attached. All this Mademoiselle Lundberg learned from answers to her questions, and seeing her keen interest, the mother continued her narrative. It was my mother who first noticed Jenny's voice, she said. Some street musicians had been playing in front of the house, and the child must have heard them and listened closely. For as soon as they were gone, she went to the piano and played and sang the air she had just heard. My mother, in the next room, hearing the music, thought Jenny's half-sister was at the piano and called out, Amalia, is that you? Jenny, evidently fearing she had done something to be punished for, crept under the piano, where my mother found her and pulling her out exclaimed, Why, child, was that you? Jenny said that it was, and as soon as Fru Lind came in, the grandmother gleefully told her daughter the incident, adding, Mark my words, that child will bring you help. 
and the mother struggling so hard to make ends meet, devotedly hoped that the prediction might come true. Soon after that, as her school did not pay, Fru Lind became a governess and the grandmother went to the widow's home taking Jenny with her. The child, who was too young to realize what such a step meant, was as happy as could be there. As she said afterwards, I sang with every step I took and with every jump my feet made. And when uh, she was not jumping or stepping, she sat in the window singing to her big pet pussycat. All this the mother told Mademoiselle Lundberg, who again begged that Jenny at least be taught to sing correctly, to which Fru Lind agreed. And the actress at once wrote a letter of introduction to her Cruelius, the court secretary and singing master at the Royal Theatre, and gave it to Fru Lind. Off went mother and daughter to present it. But when they reached the opera house and um, were about to mount its steps, Fru Lind shook her head and turned back. She could not launch her child on any such career. But here Jenny became insistent, for from all the conversations she had heard between her mother and the actress, she had gathered that mounting those steps would mean something new and interesting. And at last she had her way. They sought and found the studio of Cruelius, and Jenny sang for him a bit from one of Winter's operas, and the teacher, deeply mowed by the purity and strength of the child's voice, at once set date for her first lesson with him. After only a few lessons, Cruelius became so proud of his pupil that he took her to sing for Count Pücke manager of the court theatre, hoping that this powerful man might be so impressed with the child's voice that he would do something to push her forward quickly into public notice. One can picture the interview between Count Picke, business-like and abrupt, and little Jenny, then plainly dressed and awkward, far from pretty, and too bashful even to lift her eyes to meet the keen glance of the Count. Looking coldly from her to Cruelius, the Count asked, How old is she? Nine years old, answered Cruelius. Nine, echoed Count. Why, this is not a nursery, it is the King's Theatre. Then, with another glance at Jenny, he asked coldly, What should we do with such an ugly creature? See what feet she has, and then her face. She will never be presentable, certainly we can't take such a scarecrow. Cruelius, indignant at such brutality, put a protecting arm around the girl and said proudly, If you will not take her, I, poor as I am, will myself have her educated for the stage. And turning, was about to leave the room when the Count commanded him to remain and let him hear what the child could do. Trembling with fear of the result, Jenny sang the simplest song she knew, and when she finished, the Count was silent, for the lovely quality of the voice he had just heard had deeply mowed him. Rising, he shook hands with both the teacher and pupil, and as quick in his generosity as in his briskness, he at once announced that she was to be admitted into the theatrical school connected with the Royal Theatre and to be placed under the special instruction of operatic director Herr Berg and his assistant, the Swedish composer Lindblad. Small wonder that Jenny left the building in a flutter of excitement or that Cruelius was as beaming now as he had been depressed before and he lost no time in seeing that his little pupil was placed according to the instructions of the great Count Pecke. It was the custom of the Royal Theatre to board its pupils out, and as Jenny's mother was no longer a governess and had returned to Stockholm, the girl lived at home together with several other pupils of the Royal Theatre, and for two years worked so hard and accomplished such wonders in the development of her voice that she became known as a musical prodigy. During the year she entered the Royal Theatre, she acted in a play called The Polish Mine, and the next year in another, and the press book of her acting as shoving fire and feeling beyond her years. She also sang in concerts, in that way helping to pay for her board and clothes. 
at the theater she was taught all branches necessary to her profession and not only did she have an exquisite voice but whatever role she undertook was conceived with bold originality of style. Then, when a golden future of triumph seemed stretching out before her, came a crushing disaster. All of a sudden her glorious voice was gone. Whatever may have been the cause, the fact remained and Jenny at twelve showed her fineness of character by the way she faced the cruel disappointment and continued with her instrumental work and with such exercises as were fitted to the remnant of voice she still possessed. Faithfully persistently she worked for four long years only hoping now for smaller rewards instead of the great operatic triumph which had been her earlier ambition, trying to achieve results as conscientiously as before. Herr Berg was supervising a grand concert to be given at the court theatre and was in a dilemma. The forefact of Robert La Diable was to be given, but all his singers refused to take the part of Alice because it included only one solo. The Herr Director was distracted but finally thought of his unlucky pupil Jenny Lind, whose voice could be trusted in such a minor part, and calling her to his room he offered her the part. Without Dermer she accepted it and practiced feverishly, but on the night of the performance she was so nervous for fear her voice would fail that those near the stage could see her slender form treble with fright and excitement. Perhaps the tension and passion with which she was laboring wrought the miracle. At all events she sang the aria of her part with such wonderful beauty and richness of tone that the audience were beside themselves with admiration. Jenny's voice had come out fuller, finer than ever. The recently despised young singer became instantly the heroine of the hour, while her Barry watching behind the scenes was spellbound with surprise and joy. The next day he called her to his room and offered her the role of Agatha in Weber's Der Freischutz. Ever since Jenny first began to study and to hear operatic music, this role had been in secret her highest ambition and one can picture her standing before the director, her blue eyes flashing with excitement, her mobile face expressing a dozen varying degrees of joy while her slender girlish figure looked almost too slight for the task as she joyfully accepted the responsibility. At once she began rehearsing and one day when she put forth every effort to express emotion in the way her dramatic teacher wished, the effort was met with silence. Am I then so incapable, she thought, then glancing at the teacher as she saw tears in the eyes of the older woman who exclaimed, My child, I have nothing to teach you, do as nature tells you. And Jenny knew that her supreme effort had not been wasted. It is said that she studied the part of Agatha with all the intensity of her enthusiastic nature and uh, at the last rehearsal sang with such intense feeling and fire that the orchestra to a man laid down their instruments and applauded loudly. The next day before the performance she was very very nervous and worried but the moment she appeared on the stage every bit of appreciation vanished and as Friederike Bremer said Said. She was fresh, bright and serene as morning in May, peculiarly graceful and lovely in her whole appearance. She seemed to mow, speak and sing without effort or art. Her singing was distinguished especially by its purity and the power of soul which seemed to swell in her tones. Jenny herself said afterwards, I got up that morning one creature, I went to bed another creature, I had found my power. During her entire afterlife she kept that anniversary, the 7th of March, in grateful remembrance of her triumph as a sort of second birthday. For the next year and a half she worked indefatigably and her success as an operatic singer seemed assured. She became the star of Stockholm Opera as well as the most popular singer in Sweden and was called the Swedish Nightingale. After singing without rest for months, she was able to take a short holiday in the summer of 1839 
And Frölind, who accompanied her, wrote back to her husband, Our Jenny recruits herself daily, now in the haystacks, now on the sea or in the swing, in perfect tranquility, while the town people are said to be longing for her concert and greatly wondering when it will come off. Once or twice she has been singing the divine air of Isabella from Rabbit La Diable. Nearly everybody was crying. One lady actually went into hysterics from sheer rapture. Yes, she captivates all, all. It is a great happiness to be a mother under such conditions. Poor Fru Lind was at last receiving her compensation for the hardships of her life. But Jenny's trials were not yet over. Her voice, though pure and clear, was wanting in flexibility and she could not easily hold the tone or sing even a slight cadence. These defects she worked constantly to overcome, but saw that she was not thrilling her audiences as before, and yet she was conscious of possessing a God-given power of which she must make the most. She felt sure that she needed teaching of a kind not to be gained in Sweden. In Paris was Manuel Garcia, the greatest singing teacher in the world, and to him she felt she must now go. But this could only be achieved by her own effort, as the trip and the teaching would necessitate spending a large sum of money. At once, before her star had grown any less dim, the black girl persuaded her father to go with her on a concert tour of cities in Norway and Sweden. By this she earned the necessary amount, but the trip was very exhausting, including, as it did, so much travelling in all kinds of weather, and after singing 23 times in Lucia, 14 times in Robert uh, La Diable, nine times in Freischutz, seven times in Norma, not to mention other plays and concerts, also appearing for the 447th time at the Royal Theatre, where she had first play in the Polish mine as a child of ten. She was pretty well tired out. Two weeks later, however, she went to Paris and called on the great singing teacher Signor Garcia. The opera teacher, approaching the trembling girl, put a hand on her shoulder, saying briskly, It would be useless to teach you, mademoiselle. You have no voice left. You are worn out. I advise you not to sing a note for six months. At the end of that time, come to me and I will see what I can do for you. But it was not like her to give way even under such a blow as this. Leaving the great teacher, she went to a quiet spot and spent the six months of enforced rest studying French and at the end of the time went back to Garcia, who to her unspeakable relief said at once, It is better, far better. I have now something to work on. I will give you two lessons a week. Enraptured, Jenny flew home that day and in the following months practiced scales and exercises, four hours daily, gaining a great deal from Garcia's method, but always conscious that her real power came from another source, as she said years later, the greater part of what I can do in my art, I have myself acquired by incredible labor, in spite of astonishing difficulties. By Garcia alone have I been taught some few important things. God had so plainly written within me what I had to study. My ideals was and is so high that I could find no mortal who could in the least degree satisfy my demands. Therefore I sing after no one's methods, only as far as I am able after the birds. For the master was the only one who came up to my demands for truth, clearness and expression. After a year under Garcia's tuition, Jenny went back to Stockholm Theatre, where she met Meyerbeer, the composer who at once declared her voice was one of the finest pearls in the world's chaplet of songs, and immediately arranged to hear her under conditions which would put her voice to serve the test. He arranged a full orchestral rehearsal and Jenny sang in the Salon of the Grand Opera the three great scenes from Robert La Diable, Norma and Dear Freischutz so successfully that the young singer returned to a native city a new creature 
at last assured of her genius and of her ability to use it rightly and thrilled with joy at the knowledge of her power. At her first appearance in Robert Le Diable, the welcome was almost a frenzy of enthusiasm and her clear rich voice rang out. At once she received an offer from a Danish manager but dreaded to accept it, saying everybody in my native land is so kind, I fear if I made my appearance in Copenhagen I should be hissed, I dare not venture it. Her objection, however, was overruled. She went to Copenhagen and sang Alice in Robert Le Diable so marvelously that the whole city was in a state of rapture and it is said the youthful fresh voice forced itself into every heart. At a later concert she sang Swedish songs and in her manner of singing them there was something so peculiar, so bewitching that the audience were swayed by the intention motion. The young singer was at once so feminine and so great a genius. The Danish students for the first time in their history gave a serenade in her honor. Torches blazed around the villa where the serenade was sung and Jen responded to it by singing some of her Swedish songs for which she was famous. Then, overcame with emotion, she hurried to a dark room where no one could see the tears with which her eyes were filled and exclaimed modestly, Yes, yes, I will exert myself, I will endeavor, I will be better qualified than I now am when I again return to Copenhagen. The wonderful courage and perseverance of Jenny's girlhood in the face of almost insuperable obstacles was now rewarded. She was the great artist of Sweden, never again to be taken from the pedestal on which she was placed by an adoring public, both for her wonderful singing and for a lovely character. Once on a disengaged night she gave a benefit performance for unfortunate children and when informed of the large sum raised by it, exclaimed how beautiful that I can sing so. She felt that both the voice and the money which poured in now in a golden flood were God-given responsibilities, which she assured with all the earnestness of her sweet religious nature and her first pleasure was to buy a little home in the country for her mother and father. As we leave her On the threshold of mature womanhood, serene in her pose of body and spirit, with a noble purpose and a wonderful gift, we can but feel that Jenny Lind, the girl, was responsible for the marvellous achievements of the great artist of later years, who believed, as she said, that to develop every talent, however small, and use it to the fullest extent possible, is the duty of every human being. Indolence makes thousands of mediocre lives. The verses written of her by Topia Liss of Finland sum up the feeling of those who knew her in her girlhood. I saw thee once so young and fair in thy sweet springtide long ago. A myrtle breath was in thy hair and at thy breast a rose did blow. Poor was thy purse, yet gold thy gift. All music's golden bones were thine, and yet, through all the wealth of art, it was thy soul which sang to mine. Yes, sang as no one else has sung, so subtly skilled, so simply good, so brilliant, yet as pure and true as birds that warble in the wood.